Well, here we are. It is uh, Wednesday, October 5th, 2022, and uh, we're going to take a look. We're going to do a little preview over uh, on the sales that are coming up in Hong Kong in few, just a few days, starting on the 8th. In about three days, I, uh, I mentioned the last week we were going to get to it as soon as we could. This is as soon as we can because it's, it's been really busy around here. And I want to talk about these sales because there are some blockbusters in here, and uh, it's very exciting. And as always, if you want to see the catalogs um, on, this, on these sales, um, after they're done or you want to see them before you come over to bid them out and in the of course in the, in the famous red box click it open and bring you over to here and the three three catalogs first um, are, are, are in there and then there's the uh, fine Chinese works of art sale uh, they're already up there so you can go and look at them and uh, there, are, there are 738 other catalogs on there too that you can look at all you want on your phone or wherever you if you're traveling or something you want to read something go ahead and use them and there's some reference books there too all right, but I'm going to talk about these uh, auctions uh, because they're they're interesting. What they're doing um, in, in, at Sotheby's and Christie's are doing it. They've all adopted this. Um, they both have adopted this idea of doing smaller sort of boutique sales of of, uh, of fewer than twenty, maybe maybe twenty five or fewer lots. Some of them only have five or six lots in them, but what those lots are is what makes it so interesting because they are great rarities typically and in this case that's absolutely what's going on and uh, Sotheby's has really done a great job here of, of, of pulling in name brand um, so to speak uh, highly regarded collectors their collections for the sale um, they've done a great job uh, um, you know orchestrating everything with the imagery the photographs everything everything is just done great and uh, this is going to be parts one and two of the Sir Joseph Hotung collection uh, he was a famous Hong Kong gentleman uh, he passed away in 1921 uh, uh, excuse me 2021 and uh, had, had been oh he was a philanthropist he, he did all kinds of things but he was also um, very famous for his uh, art collection of Chinese art in particular uh, paintings jades and all this other business porcelains bronzes and we're going to go through some of the major lots coming out of his collection and a few others all right but before we get into those we're going to talk first about the uh, this is part two of the Joseph Lau collection um, it is a small sale, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 11 lots, that's it. But uh, just to give you an idea of some of the things that are in it, um, we're going to take a look at uh, this um, moon flask. There it is. It's a seal mark and period um, uh, uh, Chinese moon flask, obviously. Um, it, but what's really interesting about this is it, it, that it has two color palettes in it. Um, you don't see this very often. Typically, if they use the Dao Sai color palette or the Femi Ver color palette, they stuck with it throughout the piece. That was the, that was the colors that were going to be applied. In this case, they used both Dao Sai and Femil Rose. And that's a highly unusual combination. Um, these were, um, this piece was probably most, most definitely made during the, um, the, uh, 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 under the, under the, under the direction of uh, Tang Ying, the, uh, uh, the fellow who ran the imperial kilns for both the Yong Chen Emperor and then later on um, for the first few years of the Chunlung period. Um, he, he, he was the kiln director and he was famous for his he had an amazing taste, a great eye, very creative, encouraged potters to be creative, um, to do things that please the imperial palace for their collection. And um, this was the kind of thing th that he was famous for doing, was let's try, let's try a combination of colors. He definitely thought outside of the box. <laughs> and this is the vase. It measures about 13 inches tall. The, the harmony of the colors, the way the Famille Rose and the, and the Daltsai work together so perfectly. Um, and you have the citron, you have the citron Buddha fingers over here. The citron, they call them citron hands. Um, the, the, the 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 ripe pomegranate bursting open with seeds, and then of course the twin peaches, um, and so forth. Uh, and then the bat's longevity on the neck. Lots of symbolism on here. And uh, let's see what the estimate is: twenty to thirty million Hong Kong, which works out to uh, roughly two and a half to three and a quarter million dollars. Uh, US. If you're wondering about the exchange rate, just real quickly, um, if something is estimated at 8 million Hong Kong, um, you divide that by 8 to get what it would be in US dollars, roughly. So um, 8 million Hong Kong would be about $1 million US. So here you have 20 to 30 million Hong Kong. All right. Now, uh, this is also going to be in the sale, this fantastic um, Yung Le 
period Ming uh, blue and white uh, uh, Lotus Scroll vase. Uh, these are very rare, <laughs> obviously. And and I get in, on the identification assistant thing and on the inquiries, we get these people sending these in all the time, and I and I have to always tell them it, it's their copies. Uh, there are very few of these floating around. Um, most of them are in museums or were long ago identified as such. Uh, and, and the copies of them are everywhere, everywhere, because they're so valuable and they're so rare. Uh, so unless it's coming from one of the top five or 10 dealers in the world or one of the top two or three auction houses in the world, you can pretty well rest assured that if you see one, it's a fake. Okay. It's as simple as that. Don't, you know, um, don't go chasing it and buying it and, spending a lot of money on the fake and then you know wonder what happened okay you're not going to find these i'll just say it you're just not all right this one is a great example estimated at 25 to 35 million dollars um which is uh you know in the uh, a little over three million to a little over four million dollars and it measures uh these aren't terribly big it's a foot tall that's it all right very very attractive though very rare and then you have this is rundi um this is also in the lao collection the Xuandi American period Lian Shi bowl. And uh, this is a particularly good one. It's very, very fine. The potting is excellent, the way it's shaped all the way around. And then you have these uh, classic um, um, leaf, leaves coming off the bottom. And the interior, of course, is all painted with scrolling vines and so forth um, uh, around the inside. Uh, very Ming, isn't it? And you can see the, the similarities too in, in the way the cobalt appears here and the way the cobalt appears in the Mei Ping base we just looked at, um, how, how they were painted. There's a lot of similarities here um, and, and there are some differences, but a lot of similarities. Um, and it's, it's how you, you can really teach yourself to spot these. And again, these do not turn up, okay? Uh, it's estimated at two to three and a half million dollars, uh, Hong Kong dollars, that is. And um, it is, well, how big is this? It's about eight, in, yeah, eight inches in diameter. It's not a terribly big bowl. It's not a terribly little bowl either. Uh, and then over here, this is the um, uh, collection of uh, Dr. Wu, Bu, uh, Dr. Wu Ki Wong. And this is part two. Um, and they did part one a while ago. But this, this, this particular sale has some items in it that have been in the past a little bit controversial. Remember, we had done the video on the sacking of the Yuan Ming Yuan, and um, and we're doing another one. We're going to do a follow-up to that because there seems to be a lot of interest in that topic. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about where the stuff went. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty interesting story. But what, what long suspected as being one of the places where all the stuff went was, was where this vase, this pair of vases came from in England uh, a number of years ago. Um, and if you look down here at the provenance, this is the kind of names that appear. Whenever there were discussions about things that were stolen from the Palace Museum, the Summer Palace, um, it, 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 there are certain names that appear over and over and over. And um, one of them is Lord Locke of Drylaw, um, who died in 1900. And the vases by repute came from him. That's one of the one of the things that always seems to be the case. There's always dispute about, well, did it really, you know, uh, obfuscation. Any rate, um, and then into the collection of Alfred Morrison, Font Hill House of Tisbury. And to, to many Chinese collection, to collectors, and this isn't, I'm not, I don't want to go on about this too much, but uh, to, to many, many uh, Hong Kong and mainland Chinese collectors and Chinese collectors everywhere, um, uh, Font Hill House is synonymous with looting of the Yuan Ming Yuan. They view it as sort of just a metaphor for meaning it was stolen from their uh, museum and uh, um, from, from their, from their um, uh, uh, palace. And it, you, you, they try to deny that, but it, it is, okay? And here you have this. These, these are big vases. They're 18 inches tall, unbelievably rare, absolutely made at the Imperial Kilns, absolutely done under the directorship of, of Tang Ying, um, if you examine them carefully. The quality of this very, very rare pink ground. Uh, they made these vases only as one-offs. Uh, they might have made a pair, they might have made a single, and that was it. They didn't do big production runs of this kind of um, Imperial porcelain. They always did them in, 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 in just a couple um, um, as, you know, as little special things, all right? And they all ended up at the, at the Imperial Palaces, um, um, obviously. And uh, these suddenly appeared in England during the late 19th century. So you could 
use your imagination where they came from. At any rate, um, um, they are absolutely amazing. And the butterfly pattern, of course, was very popular in the in the uh, in the uh, Chunlung period. They remained popular. You find butterflies used um, on even on export wares in the 1840s, and then during the uh, Guangxu period, there, of course, the the bottle vases that have the butterfly pattern on them and so forth, always popular. And uh, the the decoration, the color combinations, the use of gold, the use of pink, absolutely beautiful, all the way down. And uh, they're estimated at 40 to 60 million Hong Kong dollars, um, which of course is a pretty significant amount of money. Um, uh, that works out to around five to uh, seven or so million for the two. And they could bring more. <clears throat> Some of you remember there were a couple of butterfly vases that uh, uh, turned up on the market uh, a few years ago that had the loop handles that were Chin Lung also. And they went for about 18 or 19 million, as I recall. So um, th this estimate could be low. And they were smaller than these. These are big. These are big pieces, 47 centimeters or about 19 inches tall. Um, these are big vases, very impressive. And again, from Font Hill. All right. And this also is another piece from the Font Hill collection, also collected by um, uh, Lord Locke of Dry Law by repute. And uh, this is a, f um, a four foot tall cloisonne incense burner, Chin Lung Markin period. And um, of course the Summer Palace was famous for having a lot of cloisonne in it. Um, the soldiers even wrote about how much, how much cloisonne there was in their letters. And um, here you have this, um, obviously an imperial size item, um, unbelievable quality and detail. And uh, parts of it are, are so finely done that when you enlarge it and take a good look at it, um, it, it, it is almost incomprehensibly a tiny, tiny work. When you look down here at the little tiny, tiny dragons, and all the all those are in, all those are wired. Oh, there are little wires all around here that they use when they do the cloisonne. They they overlay the body of the bronze with with wire, and then they fill those 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 little cavities that have been created by the wires with the enamel and that's how cloisonne is made as opposed to champlevé which is an entirely different process uh and but it, when you look at this thing and you and you get a sense of the detail in the minute detail and then the fineness of the casting here around the around the top of it um uh, it's pretty obvious who it was made for and um it again it's four feet tall estimated at 15 to 20 million dollars um, as I said, uh, extensive provenance, and it was bought, it was bought by Dr. Wu Kiwon um, uh, back uh, uh, apparently here, uh, maybe in the 1960s or something. Uh, it doesn't really say when he acquired it, but it was sold in 1965 um, uh, in London by Christie's, and it went into his collection. And since 1968, it's been in the Wu Lian Pai Museum, which was uh, something he was involved with. All right, and then over to this, um, possibly a one-of-a-kind vase. This is a ruby ground revolving vase. They don't get any rarer than this in the, in the, in the fine Chinese porcelain world. They really don't. Um, estimated at 60 to 120 million Hong Kong dollars. Um, uh, and uh, uh, came from, the, um, again, um, Henry Brougham Locke, first baron Locke of Dry Law, again. And then the Alfred Morrison Font Hill Collection. All right, and then and then passed down to uh, some other people, and it was bought by uh, Wu Quan. Uh, the last time it was auctioned was in 1971, and then uh, Dr. Uh, Kiwan bought it uh, somewhere along the way, and it's been in the Wu Li and Pai Museum um, since 1971. But um, again, uh, this is a, an astonishingly fine vase, again made during the the time of Tang Ying, no doubt. Um, uh, the, the, the groundwork, the, the detail, the shading of the enamels uh, are just just amazing when you when you look at this. I'm going to see if they give a, any uh, good uh, detail. They didn't give a lot of detail shots. I wish they did. Um, but at any rate, you can see that it has this very fine scraffito ground, that carved carving into the body here, all that scroll work all through the enamels. And then you have these like little vent holes at the top and the lotus flowers painted on. Uh, but n really, if, if you really love this stuff, come and examine the, the quality of the shading of the enamels, uh, which is something they, uh, the fakes always don't, don't seem to get right. 
and the tones of the greens, the tones of the yellows, and how they are all so harmonious together, and they all work together. And like I said, this is a revolving vase. You turn this upper section, and inside there is another vase. You can just see a hint of it here, um, done in probably, it looks like it's done in blue and white, uh, that will revolve to give you a changing view of inside the piece below this big cutout of a rue head. Uh, it's just, these are just absolutely mad, magnificent. Um, and it's 60 to 120 million Hong Kong. So um, they're, they're, they're thinking, you know, somewhere um, between eight and $15 million for it in the U.S. currency. All right, and then uh, this, this is from the Joseph Hotung collection, uh, Sir, De, uh, Sir Joseph Hotung. And uh, his, two of the big lots in his collection are both pieces from the Yuan dynasty. And one of them is this, this uh, uh, amazing Yuan fish bowl. Uh, and this was, um, I, I, apparently, according to the provenance, it was acquired from, um, or, or bought, it was bought by Eskenazi in 2006. And as I recall at the time, they brought four or five million dollars back then. It's estimated today at um, uh, 20 to 25 million, which is, a l is estimated lower than what it sold for, um, I, I think, back in uh, 2005. And I don't think it's because they really think it's worth less. What they're saying is, is that they're there to sell it. All right, and every collector knows that, and and this could easily go above the high estimate. It may not, with all that's going on in the world, but it it could just as well. Estimated at twenty to twenty five million dollars, but this is probably you know outside of maybe a few pieces in one of the palace museums, either in Taiwan or Beijing, um, one of the finest yuan jars known. Um, it, it appears to be of better quality than any of the pieces they they sent to the the courts in Turkey. Maybe there is in, in, the, in Istanbul or one of those, the Top Carry, Top Cappy Museum collection. But boy, the quality of this is stunning. Just absolutely stunning. The, the white space, the, the detail, the way the lotus flowers are drawn, the way the fish is drawn, all of it, all the way up and down, absolutely beautiful. Um, uh, and and, the, and these are these are pretty good size. This this vase is 35 centimeters in height, so it's about 14 inches tall. Um, and again, um, has a, 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 a fairly limited provenance. European private collection sold in 2006. That's all they real. That's all they published about it. They may know more, but but that's that's what the, but that's where it stands right now. A very rare thing. And then this, the um, um, a very unique and very rare molded Yuan Dynasty. Um, barb rimmed fish charger. Uh, the form, of course, is very similar to the the shape you see with these barb rims on um, Long Quan Celadons, and uh, here it is done on on blue and white porcelain with molded relief work flowers going around it. That is an amazingly uh, 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 clever technical thing to pull off at the time this was made during the during the Mongol era. And again, you have the fish in the center, beautifully decorated, beautifully painted. Um, and if you want to learn more about these, I, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned John Carswell, who was at Sotheby's uh, up in, uh, during the 80s and 90s. And uh, he wrote a really good book on blue and white. And he goes into great detail in the book about the, the, visualize, uh, the visual impact of these color combinations of the white against blue and, and, and how they did them in the Yuan Dynasty. He's a very scholarly guy, and it's absolutely worth reading. Um, and it explains this kind of plate and how rare it is. All right, and it's this is good sized uh, charger. It's uh, 18, uh, no, it's more than that, almost 20 inches in diameter. Um, estimated at 30 to 50 million Hong Kong. And uh, uh, it was last sold at Christie's Hong Kong um, uh, 20 years ago. And it came from the, um, uh, uh, the Jing Tuang Tang collection uh, from uh, T.T. Sui who was one of the legendary um, collectors. Um, the, his stuff was distributed. And you'll see his name a lot. You see the Sui name a lot. Museums, items from collection, all that. He, he was a big deal. Um, and you have this, absolutely a great piece of porcelain. And then over here to the uh, uh, part, part one, also in the Ho Tung collection, is this an extremely rare Huan Hua Li folding horseback chair from the late Ming Dynasty. Um, these chairs are, uh, the real ones are very, very rare. Uh, this one has all the fittings on it. It looks to be in superb condition. Great wood color, um, beautifully shaped, very elegant. These things are very elegant uh, looking. And they, of course, fold up, which is uh, was considered to be quite a thing back in that period, I imagine. And uh, they have beautiful, beautiful mounts. 
And uh, this thing has uh, got, uh, it's, it's got a strong estimate, 15 to 15, uh, 10 to 15 million Hong Kong dollars. But the last few that have turned up, and they weren't from, from this collection, other collections have had them, they seem to bring in the million two to the million eight range U.S. dollars. So that, that, that works out to about what they've got estimated here. We'll see. Um, there haven't been any great ones on the market for a few years. And uh, the Hotung collection, the provenance of this um, can, can have a big impact on where it ends up. Uh, it came, he, he bought it apparently from Nicholas Grindley over in London, who's a, one, of the, one of the best dealers in the uh, 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 country, um, uh, in, in, the, in the world. He was one of the, he was still, he's still around, phenomenal dealer. Um, and it came from the, the collection of Arthur Sackler and Elsie Sackler and Dr. Elizabeth Sackler. And they consigned it apparently to Christie's back in the day. All right, and uh, here it is coming up again. And then on to this, again, the Hotung collection. This is a, a, a Huan Hua Li reticulated carved um, uh, chest with chillings on it or baby dragons all over it. But uh, it's not the most expensive thing in the sale uh, by any stretch. It's, uh, it's two to 300,000 Hong Kong. But the quality of this is breathtaking. And um, if it goes through it with, with, with the strength in certain categories of Chinese furniture, this could go through that estimate pretty heavily um, because the workmanship on here is just outstanding. And, if you, and they took very good photographs of it, so you get a really good sense of the quality of the work. Here you can see it, um, uh, this, this superb carving. Um, they've lifted the lid up or put a sheet of white paper behind it so you can see inside of it. This is the top of it. It's reticulated. Looks like they shot it with a piece of white paper behind it to make it stand out. Uh, but the, the quality of the wood itself and the quality of the carving is the best of the best. And it is a, they just dated a 17th century, um, probably late Ming from what I'm seeing, uh, 600 to 800,000 uh, Hong Kong. Uh, but, and it's pretty good size. It's 45 by 35 inches. So it's um, um, I mean, 49 by, excuse me, by 35 centimeters, not inches. It'd be really big if it was that big. So, but it's good size. That's, that's a good size box. And uh, very nice hardware all over it. And the front doors with the dragons. It's just a, a great piece of Chinese uh, furniture um, in a very rare form. It's a seal chest, of course. All right. And then over here to this, this Young Lo Markin period circular peony box. Um, these these do not turn up very often. This one is particularly well carved. If you notice the uh, um, uh, the flower in the center, how it's how it's so gradually carved and beautifully finished in, and just very delicately done. Um, and this was this was uh, uh, something the, these boxes were known for being very delicately done, um, a moderate relief, but loads of flowers, loads of leaves, all working together um, uh, perfectly. And it, they run all the way around the side of the box, and uh, it's estimated at eight to uh, eight million to one uh, twelve million dollars Hong Kong, or um, basically um, one to one and a half million U.S. Uh, there's a good write-up on these, of course, and the only history on it: it was bought at Christie's Hong Kong in 2001, about 22 years ago, by Mr. Ho Tung, uh, Sir Joseph Ho Tung, and um, that's coming up. And then over here to this, a, a dolly, a very rare, these things are very rare, dolly kingdom bronze, um, uh, which was uh, 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 in the Yunnan district, uh, Yunnan area of China. Um, do, the city of Dali is still there, as a matter of fact. And it was, a, it was an empire, a kingdom that ran alongside, uh, uh, basically at the same time as the Sung dynasty. And they, they actually got along. They, they weren't warring with each other. Um, um, they, they, they were open communications, open trade and so forth. Um, and then they, they became part of the, they were sort of, they were left to govern themselves when the Mongols came in, which is sort of interesting, um, as long as they were cooperative, I suspect. And uh, they, they, they sort of went on, um, um, the kingdom technically ended, but they were left under their own governorship um, uh, during the Yuan dynasty. And uh, they, this, this beautiful bronze, um, uh, let's see here, uh, how big is this thing? It's pretty good size, I remember, right? Um, yeah, it's about 15 inches tall. It's pretty big. But these Dali bronzes are always um, uh, of great interest um, because of their history and uh, the, the sort of the unique circumstance that they had. 
um, um, during during the Song Dynasty. But the quality of these castings and, and, and the use of gilt and the fact that so much of this is just intact, the gilding is all intact, except for some very natural looking wear over the knees and a few little spots. But overall, this is a great example. And uh, if, you, if you like bronzes, you really ought to come look at this thing because it is absolutely fabulous. Here, here's one of it on a shelf um, under different light. And I like the base that somebody made for it. They're always making wooden bases for these, but that's a heck of a thing. And at uh, any rate, it's estimated at 15 to 20 million Hong Kong. And in the past, Dolly Kingdom bronzes that have come up, some of the standing figures have done that well. So we'll, we'll see how this does. All right, but it, again, a great example. And then this, this is one of my favorite things. I absolutely love this thing because it's really unusual. It's an azurite painted Eastern Zhao bronze with its lid. And uh, so it, it looks almost like cloisonne, but it's actually um, the powdered azurite, which they, they mixed with an adhesive and then sort of painted it on and smoothed it out over it. Big mask rings on the end, ribbed body, and ribbed bodies on these are rare to begin with. And now add uh, this colorful azurite ground, which is still intact which is pretty amazing when you think about it, how old this thing is, it's Eastern Zhao Dynasty. Um, so it's a couple thousand years old and the pigment held up. So that's, that's, that's your quality workmanship right there. And uh, here's the top of it. And uh, the piece measures 34 centimeters, or it's a little over, it was bought from Robert Ellsworth. Um, we all remember who Robert Ellsworth was. He was one of the top, top, top dealers in the world who passed away a few years ago. Uh, they did an auction of his things uh, he had that legendary apartment in New York uh, where he, he worked from and did his business. Um, just He was one of the icons. At any rate, um, uh, uh, Mr. Hotung bought this. Sir Joseph Hotung bought it from him. All right. And then uh, over to this. This is also in the Hotung collection, the Shijendi Markin period dragon plate. Um, this is an early one, uh, beautifully done. It's not an enormous plate. This is fairly small. It's nine, uh, eight inches in diameter, so it's not a charger. But the workmanship on it was absolutely excellent. I love the facial expression of this dragon. Um, um, the, 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 the difference in the way dragons were decorated in the Ming Dynasty versus the Qing Dynasty is pretty striking. Um, uh, the, 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 Ming, the Ming dragons... Um, to me, always looked a little goofy, like cartoon characters, a little cartoonish, a little, a little folky, loosely drawn, um, whimsical, and uh, this is this is a pretty good example of it, I think, um, with the with the facial, uh, the way the dragons look on here, and um, you often see them without the pearl, um, chasing the pearl of perfection. There's no pearl; they're just sort of there um, as symbols of the emperor. Um, and so forth. So there we go. The pearl were always used, it seems, in the Qing Dynasty, but not often used in the Ming. Not always. Uh, estimated at 800 to uh, uh, 1.2 million Hong Kong dollars, or that works out just, you know, 100,000 to uh, a little over uh, uh, 100, like 100 $140,000, 150,000. But rare type, perfect condition, signed on the back. There, there's the mark. Um, that's what you want to see. And there's the Eskenazi sticker on there. And I think this but this one is also in his book, The Dealer's Hand. Um, uh, so you want, if you don't have that book, The Dealer's Hand, uh, you should get it. It's a fun read. It's a fairly thick book. And it's about, the, it's, 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 it's a, not a vanity book, but it's a book that uh, Eskenazi did to talk about his career. He was reminiscing, I guess, and he, but he shared some of the images and, and, and to, the stories of people he had dealt with over the years and how he met them. And it's amazing in the book how many of them literally met him, who became big collectors, just by walking by his store, looking in the window, and becoming curious by what they saw. And they went in and got to know him. And uh, I guess he was a very likable guy, extremely likable. And uh, people had confidence in him and bought from him and built up some huge collections. But, 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 but it, in the book, I was struck by how many people didn't go to London to see him. They happened to be there for another reason, on business. They were interested in antiques in some way, and they just went into his store, and that's how they met. Okay, and then uh, over here to this, this is uh, one of the, uh, another thing I like a lot because I like brush spots, is this uh, Mallow Flower uh, uh, Ming Dynasty brush spot. Uh, the quality on this is, again, quality, quality, quality is absolutely amazing. The soft finish, the patina on this is great. The edges are still in good condition um, all the way around. Just beautiful color and beautiful quality. The delicateness with which this was carved is really something. 
beautiful, beautiful brush pot. And uh, again, you know, the, this is like the the super the super object for the for the scholar collector, so to speak. Two to three hundred thousand Hong Kong dollars. It's a big price for a brush pot. We're going to see how it does. Um, I hope it finds a home. Um, uh, but they they seem to think it was. And this was somebody that um, uh, this company, Eastern Pacific uh, Company, uh, um, in Hong Kong, um, was where uh, uh, Mr. Ho Tung, uh, Sir Joseph Ho Tung, bought a lot of stuff. Um, over the years, you see that name fairly often. They were well-known dealers off of Hollywood Road, um, and um, I believe they're off of Hollywood Road. I'm pretty sure. Anyway, um, they they sold them this brush pot. Just a beautiful example, and also another brush pot. And I'm throwing this in because uh, again, transitional wares are so popular these days. Uh, and 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 back when he bought this, he bought this in 1978. And he was way ahead of the curve. He was right in there with, with Butler, Mr. Butler in England, um, uh, early transitional wear collector. They may have been friends. And um, he, he may have bought it after talking with Mr. Butler about his things, because uh, that often happens. Somebody said, gee, that's, that's, those are nice. I think you should get one. And, uh, but this is an elegant example, beautifully decorated landscape scene on it. Very unusual, the way this is decorated. Uh, the, the, but the, the, the cobalt workmanship is excellent. It's got Anway decoration at the top. If you look carefully, you can see this um, incise decoration that's been carved into the porcelain uh, uh, around framing the top and bottom, which is often done with um, um, uh, transitional wares. But this is a really fine example. And um, the, it measures, what, uh, eight, a little under, just a hair under eight inches tall. So it's pretty good size. Um, estimated at 800,000 to 1.2 million Hong Kong. And um, that th that's going to be interesting to see how that does. Uh, I think it's a wonderful brush pot, but is there enough, you know, enough steam in the uh, engine to push it over that? Um, the only provenance is he bought it at Sotheby's in 1978. Uh, okay, and then over to this, um, another one of these iconic things um, that is sometimes underestimated. And I'm throwing it in there because the, in the Irving collection, there was a uh, pig jade of, of, the, of this shape, a uh, different color, but of this shape that was put in, I think Sotheby's had it, and they estimated it at, uh, I think, five to $7,000, and ended up selling for over $2 million, $2.2, $2.3 million. So we're going to put this one in, and we'll see how this one does. Uh, they've, they've, they've raised the estimate a bit, to two to 300000 and it, like I said, it's a different color than the other one, but I thought it would be fun to include it because you never know. Uh, I happen to like the color of this a lot. I think it's a beautiful color. It's nicely carved, um, um, good detail, you know, for the age of it. And um, we'll see how that does. All righty. And, and that's it. That's, that's about it. I think the rest of it is, oh, one more thing, this one. Um, this is in the uh, Fine Chinese Works of Art sale. This is that, the, the general sale. They have a couple of pieces that really jumped out at me. And one of them was this, another ruby ground Famille Rose um, Phoenix handled um, uh, vase. Ruby ground vases of this color are extremely rare. And uh, this is a very, very, very beautiful example with all the Buddhist Taoist symbols all over it um, on, on, uh, along the body. Vibrant colors, beautiful handles, that, that soft blue with the blue outline on the handles, gold rim on the mouth. And so forth, and this is a you know it's a 12 or 13 inch tall vase, as I recall, uh, tw a little over 12 inches, 12 and a half inches tall. Um, was it was uh, let's see, it was uh, the provenance is a collection of Mrs. Teresa Santry, gifted to her husband in the late 1980s, and then it went to um, uh, apparently Marchant's had it at some point. All right, five to seven million Hong Kong. Um, again. Could, could well go over that because this is another one of those very, very rare birds. There is a, a write-up on it, and you can check that out. And then the last thing is this, the Robin's Egg Glaze um, uh, Markin Period uh, 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 Meiping Qinglung, Qinglung uh, era. All right, and this is it. And uh, the, the, the evenness of the glaze on this piece is so perfect. It almost seems inconceivable to me. It's just absolutely the drips and drizzles and so forth down it. So even, so perfect. And the potting of this is phenomenal. It even has a little bit of a rolled out lip on the foot. You can barely see it, but it's there. Very delicately done. Nice detail. Um, smooth uh, curl, curve here to the neck and over this very lovely smooth rim and so forth. Uh, estimated at three to five million Hong Kong. 
Um, and where are the provenance on this? Sotheby's 1991, Sotheby's 2001. It went, uh, Eskenazi had it, and uh, it was uh, on view apparently um, at the uh, uh, Lingby Rock Retreat Collection. All right, so there it is, uh, and uh, let's see here. There's some literature written on it. Okay, this is in the dealer's hand. There it is, Giuseppe Eskenazi, um, in his book and so forth, it was exhibited. Uh, big estimate, three to five million Hong Kong dollars. Uh, we'll see how it does. We'll, we'll, that'll be interesting. It's, it, it, they're estimating it basically in the, um, what does that work out to? Uh, three, four, th three and a half to five million dollars. Uh, so we'll see how that goes at the, in the end. But it was a good vase, and it's pretty good size. Like I said, it's it's, it's 13 inches and change a night. It's not a little Meiping, you know, these six-inch things. It's good size. It's over a foot tall. All right. And uh, that's that's it. There's a, there's also the painting sale. There's also a lot of good jade, which I didn't get into because there's a ton of jade. Um, the, I didn't see any jades that were particularly amazing. I mean, there were some very good ones. I mean you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I didn't see any that, that were sort of in the same class as some of these um, uh, porcelains and so forth that we were just looking at. Um, I like the little pig jade I shared just because I, I happen to think they're cute. Um, imagine wearing one of those on your finger just for the fun of it. Uh, but uh, but uh, that, that that's sort of the flavor of what's coming up at these sales. And um, like I said, they're going to take place in a few days and the, the provenances, the quality of the stuff, and how many of the pieces are one of a kind items that don't turn up very often is going to have a big impact on um, on, on how it does. And uh, the people that are over there are keenly aware that a lot of the items in these these, these this series of auctions do not turn up often. Um, maybe in, in every case that we've seen, basically these have all been off the market for 20 to 50 years, and um, uh, that that has a that drives it. And also their provenances beforehand. Um, how they got to that that collector has a lot to do with the value too. So it all works in beautifully. So we'll be back with a price report afterwards, see how they did. Uh, good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, you never know. Um, thanks for watching. Subscribe to us here on YouTube if you haven't already. Please do. And uh, check out the uh, catalogs over on the bitamount.com site. Leave a comment. Uh, let me know what you what you think about it. But you know, also um, a, a lot of you co comment on uh, videos. I enjoy reading them. I read every one of them. Um, I don't always comment back, but um, because I, 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 a lot going on. But at any rate, um, if you something you'd like to see me do a video on, make a suggestion. I'm, I've, I've the um, the one on the Yuan Ming Yuan was suggested to me that was popular and the ones that we do on fakes are often brought to my attention by people that saying, did you see this auction? So um, if, if you want to suggest something, please do. If, if we can do it, I, I'm, you know, I'll put it on the list. Um, uh, we've gotten to many of the videos that people have asked for um, and so forth. All right, we'll be back with the Rockefeller uh, preview um, to that sale. And this uh, sale that's happening in Paris that I mentioned last week that I think is absolutely fascinating and we're going to talk about that too. All right, and that'll be coming up in the next week or two. All right, have a wonderful week, and uh, see you later on. All right, bye-bye.